Hey everybody, Brandon from Purpose Smoothie Co. here. Really proud to announce that we are the first sponsor of my good friend Gabe's podcast, We Got Us. Um, really proud of what he's doing right now. Enjoy this episode. Really happy for him and the guest he's brought on. Um, check, check back at the end of the podcast and we're going to give you a promo code for Purpose Smoothie Co. All right. What, what, what am I doing? Three, two, one. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Hi everyone. Welcome back to uh, We Got Us podcast. This is episode 12. We have a very special guest today, uh, Miss, let me get this right, Elena Mor- 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 Morrow. Elena oh, Morrow. Oh, I'm so close. <laughs> it's, because uh, I, it's because I told you. Yes. Got in my head. Got in my head. Um, Elena is the Senior Vice President of Grandy Studios, which is, is Kobe Bryant's legacy and storytelling space. So welcome to the podcast, Elena. Uh, our premise here is to bring ideas and light of positivity to young people. And yeah, would you tell us a bit about yourself before we get started? Please. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm the SVP and head of publishing for Granity Studios. Before that, um, I worked in various kids publishing jobs, um, in, most recently on a big commercial imprint for James Patterson, which is how I kind of came to Kobe. Um, I have always sort of been, even when I worked on the adult side, interested in the books that you read that change your life um, and that have last and stick with you. I've been a lifelong reader. Um, the thing that attracted me to Granity was the beauty of the storytelling. Um, and, you know, we, I'm sure we'll get to it. But in one of my first meetings with Kobe, he sat me down and had me read half of the manuscript that he had. And I was very like, no, we have business to discuss and we have all these things to go through. And he was like, just sit in this room for two hours and read. And I walked out and was like, okay, sign me up. Um, let's do this because I love the writing. That book was Legacy and the Queen, um, which was our second book. But yeah, I am. Um, got his first book right here. Was in our that book. one I read later. Sorry? So that book I read later, but yeah. Legacy so I read book, first. Was this written later or is no, they were all at the same time, but that was the, uh, yeah, so that's sort of what brought me here, and uh, I live in New York. Um, I have been an East Coaster my whole life, so I had a nice little bi-coastal situation where I would be in uh, New York, and Kobe, and the team would be in California, and we would go, I would travel back and forth, and we would coordinate, but books are based in New York, so I sort of yeah, sure. our books here as well. Um, and our Did we get to take the Mamba Chopper? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was like, I'll just, I'll just work from home. We were the, I was, we were the original Zoomers. Yeah, <laughs> We've been right. using Zoom for years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, on the date of filming, uh, this is October, what's the name? Thursday, October 8th, one day before game five of the NBA finals. We are living for those of us, for the, I'm sure this will go down in infamy years later for those yeah. for kids and adults, everyone watching this a couple of years later, we're living through a pandemic and we're the NBA is about to complete their pro sports are living through a bubble right now and we're about to complete the nba finals hopefully tomorrow in the the bubble yeah which is i think we're gonna look back on this time and (laughs) i was gonna say i can go get my mask except i'm in my house alone so it would be a little fun yeah yeah yeah. can you like we're not keeping physical distance here you're very close to me on my screen (laughs) um how did like kobe kobe is renowned for being obsessive in terms of how he Uh, and strategic in terms of the people that he surrounds himself with right like i think his first call after playing basketball we wanted to build kobe inc and granity was to oprah winfrey for example yeah how did how did he find you so he found me um basically um he was looking for he knew he wanted to do books um he had already signed a couple of the writers wesley and ivy in particular uh, and had talked to them about story. He started with Ivy. She was the first writer that he had hired. And sorry, sorry to interrupt. Them. But um, for those of us who aren't super Kobe, oh, sorry. like Wesley King, Ivy, I don't know. Ivy Wesley Sachin. King and then Ivy Claire Picota. So she's Ivy Claire on our books, but she has an adult career as Ivy Picota. Awesome. So he sat down first with Ivy Picota and um, talked to her about all of his ideas. And she was basically like, this is more than one book. And he was like, okay, great. I'll go get someone else. And then he found Wesley King. Uh, and then sort of looked around and he and the Kobe Inc. crew were like, we don't know how to publish books. Yeah. Um, so in that very strategic way, it was like, okay, let's go find someone who does. And yeah. 
So they kind of put out a search through their network and my name came up and he and I had a very strange phone call from his agent. Um, was, it, was it still Rob? Was it still Rob Blinka then? No, it was um, a different guy at WME called Josh Pyatt. Okay. And um, named, I guess. But uh, so anyway, so Josh called me. We had been emailing back and forth and I thought he was someone else. And so right. I didn't done research on him. And he was just like, can we talk today at like four o'clock? And then I said, sure. And sitting in my house, waiting for a phone call for that never came. And he <laughs> was because he was in California. And so he called me four o'clock his time, which was seven o'clock my time. Yeah. By which point I had left my house, gone to meet a friend for margaritas at a Havana Outpost, which is this place here on uh, Deep Calvin Fulton. Sure, sure. And I said to her, hey, listen, I might get a call that I'm gonna have to take up and trying to connect with this guy. And I think we had a time difference issue. And she was like, yeah, sure. So sure enough, the phone rings, I pick it up and it's Josh. And he, I always said he gave me like a real taste of my own medicine. I'm a person who never stops talking and talks very fast. And he, we were on the phone for 10 minutes and he talked for eight of them. <laughs> And was like, it feels like playing playing basketball with James Harden. You know, you just you get the ball once yeah. in a while, come play defense. It was one of those things where I was like, what was that? You know, his yeah. first opening line was, uh, "I represent Kobe Bryant. Do you know who that is?" I was like, "Yes. What is this?" He plays basketball, right? I think. <laughs> yeah, it's like I I think so. Sure. Um, and then he, you know, kind of was pitching me granity I guess but at the time I was like I don't know what you're talking about also granity is not a real word and he was like okay great so this sounds great I think that um you guys should talk and I was like what this is nuts but okay and he was like what's your availability like on Friday this was a Wednesday and gave him my availability and then sure enough he called me Friday with Kobe on the line and we what, talked what, what were his first words was it was he just like mom was speaking um, no, his first words were, Elena Mauro, how are you? What's up? And I was like, so cool. <laughs> and I started laughing and he was like, what? And I was like, honestly, until I just heard your voice, which was obviously his voice, yeah. I, the whole half the time I thought this was like my sister playing a prank. And, yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess this is real. He's like, no, it's, it's I'm going to call you that. I'm, I'm going to drop that from however long this conversation is go. Every time I have to say your name. Know. Yeah. <laughs> um, taking us back a little bit, um, you were hired by Kobe and Granity Studios in May 2017, right? Yeah. So it's been three years. Yeah, three, three and a half years. years. So, like, I think it's all conversation with Kobe got to start with January 26th of this year, right? Like, revisiting that morning in Calabasas when the helicopter goes down with the eight other souls. Where were you that day? And like, what were your first thoughts? Firstly, like as his friend, and then secondly, like as his colleague on how to move his legacy and his company forward. Yeah, um, it was really strange because I was here um, on the East Coast, but I was supposed to fly to California that night. Um, and I was gonna be in the office for the next six weeks for various reasons. I had a bunch of personal stuff going on, but I was at my sister's house. And she was going to drive me to the airport. And I spent the morning, which was the East Coast morning. It was like a beautiful day. And I was with my niece and nephew who are who were seven and five at the time. And I had taken them to breakfast and we had played in the river and they live right by the, in Pennsylvania, right by the Delaware River. We had this like sort of magical morning. And I actually have pictures of them from that morning that are almost painful to look at because they were like, we all just didn't know. And especially because of what 2020 has become. Yeah. It's just like, wow. We were just like such sweet summer children, you know? Yeah. And we, um, I was back at my sister's house and I was up about to start packing my suitcase and my phone kept ringing from friends who live in LA. And I had not heard yet because you know, as you know, it got sort of released on TMZ before we really were able to share a lot of the information. And so- Yeah, we all thought it was a hoax, like TMZ. Yeah, you know, we were- up, kind of right? and, stuff, and I was like, something is happening. Like something is happening. And I answered the phone and my one friend told me and I pretty much collapsed. Like my legs went out from under me and I was sitting on the floor. My sister picked up the phone um, and talked to my friend and was like, what did you just say? And she told her and was like, 
okay. Um, and I hung up the phone and was like, let me, you know, do some digging. And then it, it turned out to be real. Yeah. And I will tell you, I felt like I, it was the strangest day. Like I just felt even now I like, I have like the, the chills and the anxiety, but also the like unreality of it all. Just how is it possible that I'm doing these things? Because you immediately have to go to who are all the people I need to call, right? There are a lot of people that needed to know that didn't need to find out from TMZ, right? So yeah. Yeah. calling the writers and calling the agents, calling everybody on my team, you know, just going through the work of it, yeah. um, which was like a weird uh, distancing where you're like, I'm just not. And I basically outsourced any kind of personal response to my sister. Yeah. You know, I was, it was one of the, the strangest thing where I was on my phone the entire day. Did you still, did you still make that flight that night? Or oh yeah, oh, absolutely. But I, you know, I, I was on the phone the whole day calling and working with people, but it was like, I never actually looked at my phone. And meanwhile, my sister took my phone, um, you know, texted basically everybody that we had in common and was like, share this widely. This is my number. And if you have a question for Lainey, you should send it to me. Um, and fielded all those responses because, you know, I had traveled with him a decent amount and everyone knew I was going to be in California. So there was an immediate, are you on this helicopter um, kind of panic. And I had this overwhelming, like, just unreality of it all. And I, she, my sister drove me to the airport. I got on the plane. It was the strangest flight of my life. Um, because once I finally sat down and I couldn't be doing, it was like, oh my God, this is what's happened. Yeah. And I basically like sat in a state. I didn't, it was like one of the first lights ever where I didn't do a thing. Like I wasn't, yeah. I'm a big reader. I usually read my book. I, yeah. if I'm working, I take out my laptop. I am never kind of just like staring. And I basically stared. I, it's the only way to describe it yeah. for like six hours until I landed in San Diego and my parents were there. Yeah. So it was like this, just like, Oh, you know, like, Oh, I can be for a second. And then that whole first week was incredibly unreal. Like I was waiting for someone still sometimes to be like, no, that didn't happen. That was just, you know, it felt like he was going to show up and be like, this was a misunderstanding. You know, that was another helicopter. And like no one was in it, and I was just like, you know, living on the. I, I still feel that every single morning. Like, you know, it was it was just so like, how is it possible that this is conversations that I'm having? You know, like that whole week, as you're looking at doing stuff, and you know, we're looking at the books that we had coming out in March, and like, okay, but we also have to deal with them, right? Like, you can't just the key, he was never a person who would take a minute. Right. Um, and so we cannot take a minute. Yep. Um, it, that is not what we should be doing, but it was, it was a very kind of out of body situation yeah. where you felt like your brain was working separate from what the rest of you was feeling. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the only way I can describe it. I think like my version of that, I was before the pandemic, I was, uh, um, I was I was I was working with uh, the local government as, as a customer service representative. Um, so I was working for, I was working a front desk shift on a Sunday. You know, I thought it'd be nice hang chill a Sunday. Like, sorry to my manager, but usually I just go lift a couple weights. I go shoot around the basketball with the kids. Whatever. It's, it's Sunday. It's family day, right? But then, like, yeah, I saw the TMZ thing. Like, got like six of those. Got that forward to me like six times. I was like, yeah, it's TMZ, whatever. But then, like, I think my version of that unreality piece you talked about was like the drive home. I, I, I immediately yeah. told, I immediately told my partner working that day, like I'm out, I can't do this. Like, yeah. Like, just, I was just driving and like, like almost not in a mental health way where I like, like suicidal, but then like, you're just like, why does any of this matter? Like, you know how people are so, Oh yeah. The pe people are so, um, what's the word, precious with their time and, yes. and then traffic, they're cutting you off here, I'm going to run this red, yellow light, whatever. Yeah. But then yeah. like, when I was sitting that morning, I was like, guys, this doesn't matter. Like, let's take a second. You well, know? I mean, it was just, and it was, 
it was one of those things too, where like, there was like every aspect of it was worse for lack of a better term, right? Like, okay, his helicopter went down. He wasn't alone on it. There were the other, you know, Gigi was with him. Oh my God. There were other families with him. There were other kids. Like there was just, just wave after wave of terrible and trying to figure out. They're going to a basketball game. Like, right. And you know, how, how do we, how do I make sense of it? How do we make sense of it? How do we do the right thing by him? How do we do the right thing by them? Yep. You know, what, what do we do here? And then also how do we deal with it ourselves? You know, and like, yeah. where do you have room and space to do that? Yep. Um, and we did all take a lot of, I would say family time, you know, Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. because not so much that it was like, oh, you took a minute. Like we never really, stop working <laughs> um that's what he would want <laughs> because that's what he would want but also he was a guy who spent a lot of time with his family and they were incredibly important to him yeah. and it was like let's also honor that part of who he is yeah for sure <laughs> especially like i i remember um that first game after he passed like the lakers hosted portland right. and like uh bron Le lebron james i got into your state there as <laughs> state yeah just wesley lebron james los angeles lakers basketball yeah player at halftime or before the game gave that speech where he said like he's known for being a basketball legend and given 20 years to Los Angeles Lakers but over the last three years like he became the best freaking dad ever like, yeah oh incredible and he the thing about that I didn't watch that game I couldn't watch it um I, I didn't feel like basketball it was just like I just couldn't I I had I didn't watch television for yeah a month I didn't I mean I was like in a bubble I no, I are you a Laker fan because of Kobe or no am I a basketball fan are you a, are you a Laker fan because of working directly with Kobe or no oh yeah I would say so I mean I was never a basketball fan like he would we I would tease him all the time where he, he would show me like video of Gigi playing and I would be like god she's so good he was like I was good and I was like great but I didn't watch you play I was never a basketball fan yeah. I'm watching her and she's good hold on one sec I'm gonna just grab Oh, there you go. I got it. Um, but you know, and it was it was sort of a running joke that yeah. I never knew who anybody was or what their stats were. Yeah. And I also didn't really care, right? Because it didn't matter from the things that we were doing together, yeah. right? And yeah. it was um, you know, we would be at things and we would meet writers and we'd be like, that's this person for me, right? Like you that's yeah. the person yeah, kind that's of part of, of book writing. Right. Yeah. You know, like they're, that's the person that like, I have read every word they've written and that's exciting yeah. to be here. And I'm going to go leave you at this conference with yeah. the security team and meet that person yeah. <laughs> and, you know, stuff like that. So I think that. You think, sorry, do you think that was important in a working relationship as opposed to, let's say like 75% of the world who like would gawk at the opportunity to work with Kobe, but for someone yeah. neutral like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I don't think that he, I think there, I mean, there are certainly people who work there who are basketball fans, um, who work at Granity Studios that are basketball fans that are working on other teams, not the books team. Mm -hmm. um, but even within that, none of them were really like big super fans, right? I mean, everybody was there because of the work they did and, um, and we're not in awe of him, yeah. right? Because you cannot be effective if you're, I mean, in any job role, you can't be effective if you're in awe of the person that you might have to give bad news to, yeah. or the person that you have to be real with. You know, if I'm presenting you with an option, or, you know, the guys who work on detail are coming up with ideas for things, or, you know, if you're the, you had a whole team that kind of built the world and worked on things and the production side, and, you know, all of these different part of that is this is the budget and this is the availability of the talent and this yep. is the time constraints and you know all of those real world parameters to getting work done if Kobe you are nervous time those right so Kobe didn't mm -hmm. live in the real world a lot of the time he had his own he he was in granity before granity was a thing <laughs> yes he lived in his own universe many yeah. times yes yeah. but he like, uh, like, like yeah you want to sit me down no i'm, I'm gonna keep playing until i tear my freaking achilles like doesn't matter right and you're like <laughs> we there's just and but we all and we all had our own versions of that within our industries i would say yeah. but yeah you can't be afraid to give that person the information they need yeah. to make the decisions that they need to make 
Yeah, this yeah. is this is why I, I'm not working for like Scarlett Johansson. You know, like I just, I just couldn't have those difficult conversations. Right, you're like I can't give you bad news, so right. this is right. not gonna work. <laughs> yeah, um, gonna... transitioning a bit here. What story? I, I we we cheated a little bit. We kind of talked about this uh, for our viewers. We we had a pre-conversation, but you know, it's the only natural. Yeah, we prepped um, a little. Yeah. What story do you think Kobe still wanted to tell? Because in my eyes. Like Wizard was it for him? Like this is, this is Harry Potter. I, movie, like you said, this this is Phil Jackson talking to him, right? So like, what story did he still want to tell? You think? I think, I actually think there were a lot of stories that he still wanted to tell, but I would say, finishing Legacy and the Queen. Um, that story. There was so much about it that he just loved every minute of you know and he loved i mean he loved all of them but wizenard not that wizenard is complete by any stretch of the imagination but i think a lot of the message of wizenard he felt like he had gotten across um there's still more story there yeah. but the like big lessons i think he felt like he already knew. in the epica series the second book is coming out in december on december 15th mm -hmm. and there's a lot of information there that um we would have explored in a lot more books if he were around and we're sort of trying to figure out how to do in this book. And I think we, I hope, I think and hope we did a really good job. Um, so I feel a little differently about that one, although I know how much he loved that story. Um, and Legacy was the one that I think, um, it was a little bit different, you know, it was totally with the tennis and a different kind of character sort of loosely based on Serena Williams. And, it had the most kind of room to go. Yeah, so I would say that one. But I felt like being the let's say mega fan that I am, like it seems like from the outside, like tennis was his favorite sport to to watch or one of. He, yeah, he loved watching. Yeah, one of. I think you know. I think he he loved watching tennis. He loved watching women's basketball. He loved he loved watching soccer. I mean, he's been a soccer fan since he was a kid. Yep. He, you know, liked watching the Eagles because he was a Philly fan. Yeah. Um, I think, I think like, like is an understatement there. Like with the, the photo, uh, the video that Vanessa posted when he was just like on his couch. He uh, when they, when they made, we, we were like texting the whole time. And he was like losing it. Um, yeah. I'm and, probably going to have a similar reaction tomorrow night if uh, Lakers. Right, right. exactly. <laughs> like, he was just a fan. But he also, I mean, the thing that he loved watching anything about tennis in particular is that he is such an admirer of the athlete right and their ability and the way that and the mental focus of the game and I think he felt like he really saw that a lot with tennis um and he like loved talking to tennis players about their game and about their mental fitness and their toughness and what they were working toward um and then you can see even with younger players I mean he had a good relationship with Naomi Osaka and um Kobo Goff and just like how could he be helpful to them how could he help them prepare um, you know, he had a lot of admiration and also um, recognizing like, is what yeah. I would call it. I, I absolutely love when Naomi won the US Open and he said that I, I brought Kobe's jersey with me every game because it felt like it gave me superpowers or it helped me prepare. Like, it was amazing. I mean, it, I, again, yeah. cried through the whole thing. Yeah. Um, okay. So kind of, let's lighten things up a bit. On the Granity Instagram page, I think, yeah. all when this post was made, but there's a fascinating graphic that said, if you could, excuse me, ooh, that, you guys, you, you guys don't have this in um, USA, but it's, it's bubbly, um, yeah. it's by Michael Buble out of Burnaby, BC, and, um, excuse me, so I, I stopped drinking during the pandemic alcohol, <laughs> so, but, so, to get that dopamine of still cracking, like, a beer open, like, I've started drinking sparkling water, and I, I'd go through, like, 12 of these a day, but then the burps come up. <laughs> Okay, anyways. Uh, I, yeah, I, just, I am. I mean, I have a soda stream. I understand. I have yeah, soda stream all day long. Same thing, same thing. So on the That's why you can edit this. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, That's the beauty of editing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it says, you could, if you could only read one book for the rest of your life, it would be blank. Um, for me? How would you read? Yeah, how would you answer that question? Uh, I think if I, so if I could read one book for the rest of my life, it would be, well, I was gonna say, I know what the book would be. It would be Pride and Prejudice by, you know, Jane Austen. I read Pride and Prejudice all the time. 
um, because it's comforting, because I love the language, because I love the stories between the characters. I mean, I love the characters. Yeah. And I, it has all of the elements for me that I love in story and I love in books. And yet, which, because which I've... Hmm? The, the elements that you love are, I want to unpackage that a little bit. Oh, that, you know, like strong characters that you relate to and that you want to root for. And, you know, a, a pretty page turning story arc for something that was written over 200 years ago. And a, a what? Yeah. Holy cow. And, you know, like a relationship that you want to root for, yep. but that also all of these ancillary relationships. I mean, I'm, a, you know, I have a sister that I'm very close with, as I mentioned, and then I have a bunch of cousins that I'm incredibly close with. And, so those relationships always connected with me. Uh, you know, one of the things that I like about all of our, like so much about all of our Christianity books is that the relationships that are outside of romantic relationships, that because we're writing for middle grade, right? We have- Friendships. Right? Yeah, it's about friendship, it's about siblings, it's about family. And I don't think we explore those enough in fiction. Um, I don't think- And, and, la- and lack of family for rain, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, and in um, in each of them, there's Rain, different, one of the, right? sorry, just for our non-geeks, non-Kobe geeks, Rain is yeah. uh, the, the, the Wizard is written through five different five, yeah, five different yeah. perspectives of the players, uh, and they, coached by basically a pseudo Phil Jackson, and each chapter repeats the same events through their lens. And Rain, it op- the book opens with Rain, who has a very difficult, a turbulent relationship with his biological family. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Back yeah, to- exactly. <laughs> That's, and right, you know, and, and there's so much there. Rain, I love Rain. I love Twig, um, which is the next character who, um, yeah. you know, in who comes, his story comes next, and he's sort of the misfit. Um, and you can't quite, for me, you know, I think the thing that's interesting about those five characters is that like there is something of Kobe in each of the five, right? Like everyone always would wow. say to Kobe, "Which one are you?" Wow. And he would say, "I'm all," of them, you know. And so I think that that's incredibly powerful right because they are so different and to know like the wow his, yeah. we, might have to, we, need to, we might we might need to unpackage that post yeah. interview because i got a lot of geeky questions about that but yeah yeah but i uh, that is always how he related to it i mean his book i would say i'll answer for him the book that he would say he probably read the rest of his life um is he loved the alchemist um yes. and he loved allegorical mm-hmm. stories like that um yeah. there's another one that's named as escaping me right now it's called something in the seagull um and he jonathan, jonathan livingston seagull there you go yeah. the yeah it, i only um, know that because he he gave a motivational speech to the speech to the eagles and he said Ev, y'all y'all all need to read this book and he was like jonathan livingston seagull he I mean, loved that book but he he was much more drawn to those allegorical stories those stories that were going to teach you something yeah. uh and what we tried to do with all of the granity stories what we tried to do in all the novels was to take that thing that he was attracted to the the message the lesson Mm -hmm. and then package it in incredibly interesting and well-drawn fiction right great characters great story that makes you want to turn the page and if you're like a 10 year old you are reading this great book about a bunch of five friends who are basketball players and then the games that they play and the magical things that happen to them but you also the you tigers they have away. to fight you know <laughs> yeah you're taking away all these lessons yeah um, um i kind of cheated because i i pre like as the interviewer i got to like give you the answers to my own questions i i, I believe i wrote that my answer to that question would be the bible or fiction wise it'd be 1984 um, i mean it's a great year to be reading 1984 <laughs> <laughs> yes absolutely absolutely but, should maybe all reread it this year yes please required reading and anyway i'll, I'll if you, if you send me a DM, send me an email, I'll send you all a copy. Um, but I think I would change that, actually. I'm going to go based on how Kobe was drawn to the allegorical nature of those things and how Kobe saw himself in Rain, Twig, Cash, Pino, Lab. He did. I see, I see myself the most in Jonas from The Giver. Oh, this, interesting. This person who's been giving each person is given a role. And I, I almost feel like no disrespect to all the other Kobe fans in the world, but as someone who grew up without my dad, like he was like my dad. So now that he's passed, I hold all of these memories and that through conversations like this, I, I, that's my role. Yeah. To carry on that legacy off the basketball court because I am five, nine and a half and uh, I'm not Jeremy Lin. So. <laughs> um, 
It's fine. I'm five three. I was always like, I don't think that I. There was a lot of tall people in that building, and yeah. <laughs> I don't think that I met the height requirement. I think this only worked because the first time you met me was on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Elena Morrow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was like, that was, yeah. Yeah. So even though like you're not a fan, and then therefore, or, sorry, not you weren't a fan before, which has allowed you guys to have a beautiful working relationship eight months or nine months since the accident, how do you think, on upon reflection, how has Kobe personally impacted you the most, professionally or personally? Oh, wow. Um, oh, in a million ways. Um, you know, I'm going to start crying. <laughs> give, give me top no, but, three. We live, we live in a very... No, no, I, I, you know, I think that, you know, personally, we were friends, right? And I... Cry, sorry. I miss that friend, right? Like when the person you would text when something exciting happens, right? Like the um I have been like endlessly curious and having imaginary conversations with what he would say about the pandemic, you know, and like the I I have thought about it a hundred times and it is hilarious well, to me. What would you time. hypothetically say? Like outside of Mamba mentality, we'll get through this. What do you think? Like that's what a fan thinks he would say, but what do you like what does a friend think he would say? I, I think <laughs> you, I think he would be like, we have to be careful, we have to be cautious, like you've got to take every precaution, like, you know, because family was so important to him. And then he would also be like in the office every day. You know, like it would be like a very strange mixed message. <laughs> yeah, because you guys are still, or the, the U.S. is still in a pretty harsh lockdown. Like restrictions have been. Yeah, I mean, they're they're lifting here in, in Canada, in California, and um, and in New York, you know, and people aren't. Some people are in their offices, some people are not. Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, it sort of depends, but uh, have you yeah, seen the I, meme? Sorry, have you mm -hmm. seen the meme that uh, like it's a bittersweet meme, but they were like, yeah, like the uh, world went to a hell basket. Like Kobe was the the glue that held the world together, and I was like. You know, that, that's very true for me, but it, as we continue to go down this year and depending on how the elections go. Oh, I, I mean. <laughs> like a truism, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was, I, I, <laughs> I've said this many times that I felt like, you know, on January 26th, my like knees got cut out from underneath me. And as we, and for all of us, like that whole, the whole Granity crew, I was not unique in that. And that we, we as a group, you know, it was like, let's just get through February and Memorial and all this stuff. And then it was sort of like the first week in March where you felt like, Sorry. I'm definitely not okay, but I'm sort of on solid footing. Yeah. And then all of the pandemic, like pandemic hit, lockdowns hit. And it was, March, right? you know, it was just one of those things where it was like, and we were all, you know, emotionally like here, right? And we were just sort of starting to get here. And then that happened. And basically, it was like the whole world met us where we were, yeah. which was yeah. <laughs> definitely not what I wanted to happen, right? Like, I wanted us to kind it's like, of- like uh, the German term Schudenfreude, right? Like, misery. Yes, <laughs> right. It was, it was, yeah, it was just um, unbelievable. Yeah, you talked, you talked, you spoke on, sorry to cut you off. Um, no. You spoke on, you know, let's get through February, let's get through the memorial. Um, was was you or sorry, were you and the the Grandity team at Staples for that day? We were, yeah. Um yeah, we were all there. And it was I mean, Vanessa did an amazing job. Vanessa Bryant who spoke and yes, eulogized her husband and her daughter. She did an incredible job. It was yeah. inc amazing to watch because it was sort of like I don't know how you, you're getting through it. I yeah. had a hard time getting through it. I have a hard time listening to his voice. I've gotten a lot better in the last nine months, but yeah. anything with his voice in the first, I would say three to four months was like a no go. Yeah. Just yeah. um and that stadium you you know you walked into Staples and it was everywhere. And I one of the women who I work with um who was the our production director for Bucks Team is Lisa Dagostino. And yeah. I looked at Lisa and I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. And she was like, me neither. And then we were like, okay, let's go do it. You know, it was a very Kobe-esque, like, this is going to be really hard. Yeah. And, but there's no way out but through. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was highly considering wearing the shirt they gave out uh, during the Portland game for this interview. But for yeah. uh, professional purposes, uh, I am much more mature and articulate in a hoodie than I am in a Kobe Bryant shirt. <laughs> <laughs> 
mean, I'm definitely not wearing my Kobe Bryant shirt. Yeah, yeah. We should we <laughs> should coordinate what we were wearing. Haunt me if I showed up somewhere in a Kobe Bryant shirt. Yeah. Um, um, speaking of that ceremony, like I want to give, I I love Vanessa and, oh, from a distance. Yeah. Um, but like Rob Palinka, holy yeah, smokes! Good like thing. that one. That one isn't as popularized because I think like due to the gravity of Michael Jordan. Vanessa Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, like Rob just kind of got scuffled, right? But then, like, yeah, that story he told, like Kobe's last text, yeah, is to help the next someone from that next generation and to get her uh, in- a baseball internship, I believe it was, and yeah, that is the ultimate last act. And I, I think there's been a lot of memes. It's very Kobe. His last game, or thir- April 13, 2016, his last game. His last basketball play was throwing a. A uh, full court pass to Jordan Clarkson for the two handed jam. And yeah. Then Utah calls timeout. He gets hugged, and like he's like, that's so ironic because he loved to shoot in his in his heyday, and his last yeah. play was an assist. And like, ir- yeah. very ironically and poetically, his last play of life is an assist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he loved that stuff, though. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I think we were talking earlier. Um, maybe before, I think probably before we started about, you know, how much he liked working with kids and meeting kids and hearing kids' stories. And that was like a profound source of joy for him. And if he could help somebody, he wanted to. Um, And it was why we were doing the books, right? It was why he wanted to do the next thing, right? Was he was, he was not done. He was still also a young man when he retired. He had a lot ahead of him. And so what he wanted to do was how am I teaching these lessons, right? How am I putting you on the court with Phil Jackson, right? What, what are the ways that I can do that? And how do I help the most people? Um, How do I get that message across to the most people? I think this really accomplished that for sure. Like there were so many times, I think certain times where I'm like, okay, Kobe, like reading it, I've read it four times at this point. Certain times I'm like, okay, I get it, Kobe, you're, you're better than everyone. You're obsessed more than anyone, but just like, the level of detail that he had, like nothing was left that he loves saying that no stone is left unturned. And through that book. No stone is left unturned. No, he is. <laughs> he found some SHIT under each stone for sure. So. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You would be like, can you just put that down? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Put that stone away. Just yeah. Yeah. whatever yeah. you found, whatever idea you're texting me at three o'clock in the morning, yeah. just put your phone on the nightstand, go back to sleep. Let's talk in the morning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's a good transition and a good segue. Like, uh, you know, Cove's famous for the, the cold calling piece, like the obsessive uh, reaching out to different people, like power people in their in the highest level, the highest person they can reach in the respective industry. So like, can you share a story or two about just how, you know, 3 AM, what he texts you or like, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> Oh yeah. I mean, the, the whole, I'm telling you the whole way we met was a, basically a cold call. I didn't expect the phone call and yeah. he, yeah, he would text you all this stuff in the middle of the night where you were like, I, I'm also an, I'm also an insomniac. So it didn't, I would always be awake and I would look at it and be like, I'm not responding to this. Even though, you know, I'm awake, I'm not responding to this. And it would be, what if we do something different with this part of the design? What if we move this here? What if we, all of these things that would, in essence, defy the law of physics. And you would have to be like, what? No, that's an crazy idea. How did, how did you draw a boundary with like, with the greatest basketball, for me, the greatest basketball yeah. player of all time? Like, how are you like, don't text me at 3.30 a.m. Or I guess 6.30 for you, right? I would reply and say, dude, it's this time here. If you should be asleep. And sometimes he would be like, I'm in China, I'm wide awake. I'm like, right, but I'm not. Like, <laughs> just, you know, and, if it was something that I, he needed, I mean, we were always in contact and like there was nothing, if there was an, if something important and something very work or emergency, then sure. Yeah. But he would send you stuff that you would be like, I'm not responding to that. <laughs> Do you think he successfully, uh, he's been at the book game for like two and a half years or three. Did he successfully convert a thousand? What, what did a thousand makes before 7 a.m.? look like in the book in the book world oh uh yes he definitely did he would <laughs> that's amazing i would say yeah for sure um you know he i think it i mean it, i would say that it looked like he would, <laughs> he would be at his desk at eight o'clock in the morning 
Yeah. Um, he would be reading whatever had come in from whatever of the writers. He read a lot of it. He didn't always read everything because he would get to the point where he trusted people, right? Um, and part of that trust was that we were doing the book version of getting to the gym at seven o'clock in the morning, right? So we have a, I have a team of editors. He was very close with, there's two editors that we work with that he was incredibly close with um, and talked to all the time. And he knew that those two women, one Abby Rangers, the other is Noah Wheeler. Um, he knew that Abby and Noah were going to read every single word 10 times. And so he got to a point with them where he didn't have to do it. Right. Uh, he knew that I was going to be incredibly focused on getting us where we needed to go. And so not that he didn't have to be focused, he was incredibly focused, but that his, um, he could let me do that. Yeah. Right. And uh, the woman who, like I mentioned before, Lisa, who runs our production for the books has made that fuzzy book in front of you and that you like and um, all of our books. You know, that she was going to pay attention to every single detail. She did. We didn't do Mamba Mentality. That was someone else. But that, you know, that she was going to pay attention to every detail, that he could verify all of his details with her, um, that he could call her with a crazy request. And, you know. Yeah. Um, I know we're running over time a little bit. Uh, Sorry. I, I, yeah. I'm, I, I'm very verbose. <laughs> yeah. uh, you still got like, can we have, can we, you got 10 minutes? I do. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, but you shared this before we hopped on. The story about my favorite thing about this, I love how we're on video so I can actually show the audience. Yes. Our code of Wizenard is a freaking tiger, guys. And mm -hmm. because there's a tiger that the team has to navigate in each of the five iterations of the yes. story being told. And please tell the story about the, the tiger of our code. Oh yeah, I, you said that you thought the tiger was your favorite part of that book. And yeah. I believe I rolled my eyes and was yeah. like, mm, yeah, the tiger's nice. Um, <laughs> he got this idea um, in his head that we should make the barcode a tiger and, or that we should do something different with the barcode. And I think one of the guys in the Granity universe kind of space was like, what if we, what if we did something different with the tiger? They came together, the two of them were like, what if we make it a tiger? And I, lost my mind. There is no other word for it. I, we were, we were, we were very late in the game is the first thing we were like, you know, files at the printer. Um, so it was a very late and expensive time to make a change. So and in before that, it was just a regular barcode before he yeah. made that. Pick. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we, Holy S-H-I-T. <laughs> and I was like, here is my, he was like, what's the problem? Why can't we do it? And I was like, the problem is it will not scan at a retailer. So like when a person goes to buy this book, <laughs> they won't be able to purchase it. And we, and we he, the company are making no money otherwise. <laughs> he was like very resistant yeah. to the fact that it couldn't be the way that he wanted it to be. Yeah. And basically after a lot of yelling, um, and I can like picture where I was yelling because we were, I'm in New York. And so I was on, it had a lunch, a work lunch in Midtown. And yeah. I, he called me as I was like leaving this lunch. And I was like, I can picture the corner. I'm like on the corner of 52nd and 6th Avenue, <laughs> just screaming into the phone. And so you have a picture of this or uh, you, you have a mental, no, I can picture it in my head. Okay, I was you screaming into the phone. Otherwise you have to please send that to me. I would love <laughs> what? do you, what do you, what, and he was like, you said, and I, this is the problem is that I had said that we could try it, but I, I meant on a future book, right? Yeah. Like a, in, in, when we've had a lot not of time and we can, <laughs> right. Not a book that was out of the printer, you know, at a future book, we can try it. We can figure it out. We can work on scanning. We can, <laughs> you know, practice, practice, whatever. Yeah. Um, so how, did, and, how, how did you get to a point where, oh, became, hold, on, yeah. hold on one second. I have to yeah. go get my plug. I didn't know how long we were talking. Um, so we, this is a great time to, uh, to plug my, to plug my sponsors, you know, or my lack thereof. <laughs> I'm actually going to keep this part in this, this speaks to the quality of conversation that, uh, we're able to, we, we, our conversation outlasted the battery life and that that's that's mama mentality too <laughs> i don't know we'll have to see you show it to me there there might be pants that we don't want the world to see <laughs> yes, okay okay sounds good sounds good yeah but how did uh, we get okay so, okay, so he, on the so phone. he was like i want to do this barcode you said i could do it 
<laughs> and I was like, I did not say that. I said, you could do it in the future. I did not say you could do it on this book that is like at the printer. And we went back and forth and back and forth. And he basically worked with um, the designer who made that barcode, who was a guy who was in the office. His name is Jeff Toy. He did a great job. Yep. And Lisa, who's the production director, both of whom have uh, cooler heads than myself and Kobe. <laughs> right. And basically Jeff and Lisa together came up with a scenario where the, you see the main body of it is the barcode and that part scans and then the tiger is removed. There's some space and yep. it's around it. Yep. And that was the solution. And then once they had that and it worked, I calmed down. Once, I, once they could prove to me that it worked. And in fact, they sent me, Lisa and Jeff sent me a video of them scanning it and it getting the approved like light. Yeah. I was like, okay, we can do this. We can, if, as long as someone working in a store could sell this book, then, yeah. then we can do it. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I I'm saying that like, that's one part of, I think that was probably the most challenging for him, right? The, if that happened on the basketball court, it would be Eric Fisher, give me the ball. I am going to the rack, getting fouled, finishing this layup. We're, we're, and then I'm going to play defense, pick you up full court. Yeah. We're going to cut this lead down piece by piece. And I don't, I don't need any of you MFers, but then, you know, but yeah. in, uh, in the workplace, it does not happen quite that way, Mr. No, Brown. it was literally, I mean, I remember distinctly him thinking, you said we could do it. And I was like, I did not, did not say that. Yeah, we, <laughs> we need to we, about we, it. We we never. Bill Jackson on this podcast and ask how many times did he say that, Bill, you said I could take 50 shots, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, why would no, I have no, said that? Dump it into Shaq. Dump, just pass the ball to Shaq, please. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, at some point, I will, hopefully, we get to Phil. Um, but, yeah, that'd be great. Um, being cognizant and respectful of your time, shifting gears. Yeah. Is this, outside of Randy a little bit, more so about, you uh, know, more out. Well, I can't say it as cool as him, but more about you as a person the idea and the initial premise of the podcast is what would you essentially, what would you tell a 16 year old version of yourself with all the experience you have now? Right. So yeah, go at it, please. What would I tell a 16 year old version of myself? Uh, well, that's sort of interesting because I would tell a 16 year old version of myself to like hold, basically hold steady and keep at it because I was always incredibly driven um, and very focused. And there are there were like definitely moments where, you know, publishing is like a long, slow road and you would kind of doubt that it was gonna take you to the place that you thought it was going to, or like, was that the right choice and things like that. But the, and I knew, I knew from when I was in high school that I wanted to be, you know, either, either a writer or in books or in magazines. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty sure I wasn't a good enough writer. So probably books and magazines. Um, and so telling that person, Hey, you're right. Stick with it. And like, keep, keep at it. Keep focused. Don't really listen to the noise, right? Like this is, if this is what you want, yeah. you can do that, right? I mean, I always felt like I could do stuff with the force of my will. And then meeting someone like Kobe, we were a good match in that way because you were like, haha, we can do it with the force of our will, you know, like. And then just, the barcode happens and then, and then the wills clash and something has to get. There was, yeah, there were a couple of those where we had will, clashing wills and some I won and some he won. Yeah. Um, That's the beauty of any working relationship, right? For it to uh, last right. beyond Jack and Kobe years, but. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No, yeah. I mean, he would, you know, and he, I, and it really was a collaboration. Absolutely. But yeah, I think that's what I would tell 16 year old me was that like your, your focus and your dedication will be rewarded. Yeah. Especially when you know, in your follow up question to that, I think basketball is an ultimate collaboration. Like a Kobe said all the time, like is the ultimate teacher. Like you said how he converted and he began to trust his teammates. Right. And, um, you know, we're on the, in the, in the publishing world. We're on the 10 year anniversary of his last championship against yeah. Boston Celtics. And like, when you said like, you would trust his team, um, your colleagues to read something 10 times. Yeah. And he would give them that space. I, my mind immediately went to game seven. I think we're up five. 
swings the ball, the classic swings the ball to Ron Artest moment, yeah. and Ron Artest is the three in court, and he says to the post game, Kobe, pass me the ball. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Um, Ten years ago. Yeah, I mean, you, he, we, yeah, it was a collaboration. And I remember, like, the day that was in our, went on sale mm. was incredibly hectic and we had a million things to do and it was our first book and it was like media event and um uh molly carter who you yep. you know who you know ran all of i know of, like I, I would i wish i right, right. But she you know, did all of our <laughs> did all of the all of our everything she did all of our everything she ran the studio including publicity and media and everything yeah. Yeah. so she had all these things books and we had the events team had a bet had things booked and I had things booked and the writer and we were all going and going and going and the whole publishing team was like all hands on deck because we had the books were selling like crazy and um it felt like you could never like take a minute to just be like oh this is what has happened and I remember that like the end of that first day him just being like it, like he and I I'm like we did it we did it and I was like oh yeah wait we did this like we yeah you know, this was a conversation that we had that like, it was an idea in his head and a conversation that I had like in my apartment, like, like this one Yeah. It started with a phone call, right. Where he was like, I have all these ideas. What do you think? And I honestly didn't understand in that phone call that he was trying to hire me. I mean, I yeah. thought we were, I don't know what I thought we were doing retrospectively. And I remember saying at the end of the call, Oh, Oh wow. This is a job. I, I am not prepared for that. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I interject for a sec? Yeah. Um, so like get shifting from, or like not shifting, but taking a step sideways from the book space. My favorite, um, if we were to ask the Granity Instagram question, what's the one movie you would watch for the rest of your life instead of book, I would watch Inception because yeah. like the most power, like I think this Leonardo says, multi, Leonardo DiCaprio, so we're, 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 we're really at the first name basis. We're first know, name I'll, I'll text him for lunch once in a while. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio, the lead actor of Inception says multiple times on, in the movie, that an, an idea whose t that's time has come is the most powerful thing. And it can eat away at you or it can build you, right? And I think yeah. like, yeah, I think that is, and ideas plus execution make the world run to me. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. got two quick ones for you before I let you go and uh, eight o'clock. So you've probably got like bedtime things to do. <laughs> I'm an insomniac, we can talk all night. Okay, perfect, perfect. <laughs> I'll text you at three, like COVID. <laughs> three in the morning. I will be awake. Yeah. Um, yeah, two quick ones. What's next for you and Reality Studios? Yeah, well, we have our next book is coming in December, December 15th. The follow-up to Epica, which is River of Sand, which, you know, the, the two main characters in the Epica series are two 10-year-olds, Prisha, who is the princess, and Rovi, who is kind of a street kid who then gets a scholarship to a fancy sports school. And they meet at school and they, um, what I love about that book and that series is that Ivy Pakoda, who is the writer in her, you know, in the literature that she writes for adults and that her novels for adults are all um, mysteries. And, and so she brings that great sense of writing a mystery and solving a problem to the story. And so there are two kids and they get to school and there's mysterious things happening at the school and they have to you know, figure out what, what those things are and what the forces are that are bringing those things about. And there's an entire, um, you know, cast of gods and goddesses and what they mean. And they're all in that book. And then the, at the end of that book, you know, they, it ends sort of at the end of their school year. And now there's another uh, school year we're returning to those characters. And it's this time- Potter, right? every, every book is a school year. It's, it's going to be beautiful. So, yeah, uh, but this one, they are actually going to basically the Junior Olympics, the equivalent of the Junior Olympics. And so it doesn't take place at the school, yeah. it kind of takes place in a different city. And it's sort of based on um, an ancient uh, Alexandria. And yeah. so there's a lot of, or Tunisia, sorry. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of, you know, sand and desert and it, the look and feel of it is very different. And of course, again, there are mysterious things afoot and so, so and Ruby have to Mark figure Bush it out. Be a cactus then, right? <laughs> <laughs> Cove, Cove would want that. Um, <laughs> this is going to be a tough one because I, I, I answer it myself a lot internally. Um, I guess last question for you is how will you remember 
OVB and gay. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I remember different things about him all the time, but mostly the way that he paid attention. Wow. You know, like that, about that, you know, like you really, he was always the same focus that he brought to everything that he did, right? He brought to his friendships, he brought to his working relationships, he brought to his family. And so, you know, like I sort of told you this a little earlier, I think before we started, but like to remember, you know, a lot of the people that I work with other than myself have small children, you know, who had which kid and how old they were and what they were going on and to always ask and be paying attention and follow up and just things where um, you would expect from a regular person, but you would not necessarily expect from someone like him. And that, but with all of us, he really was connected and paying attention and did see himself sort of as a colleague. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, he really was listening, which is why, so sort of the barcode, part of the reason why we got in that big argument is because he, when he said, you said I could have this, <laughs> it was because he was paying attention, right? Like I listened to all the things you said and all the parameters and you said that we could do this. I was paying attention, you know, that's, and yeah, like, that. sometimes it would bite you, but he was, you know, he was fully present. Yeah. Um, and I think that is sort of the thing that I remember and miss. Um, um, I'm, I'm in I'm in my master's right now uh, pursuing to become a psychologist and that's yeah. like the number one trait is do you listen to respond or do you listen to hear and are you actively listening and I think yeah like, I've never spoken to Kobe well, I've spoken to him many times up here yeah I, I, it's beautiful that my hero is someone who actively listens oh yeah he's definitely an active listener sometimes you'd be like well, I wish you hadn't heard that <laughs> Shaq is better than you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't say it. Yeah. Only from Matt at you. <laughs> Actually, what, sorry, one last one. We, we talked yeah, about yeah, 16 year old version of yourself. Are you, are you proud? Would, would 16 year old version of yourself be proud of 25 year old version of you now? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Do you think I'm 25? <laughs> no, I'm <not> 25 <laughs> sorry, I was like, what? No. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Yes, I do think that 16 year old me would be proud of where I am. Oui. Um, you know, I don't think that, I'm proud of where I've ended up. I mean, I think that- I, I know we can't touch each other in pandemic, but we can, we can do that. Yes, <laughs> I got it. Yeah, I mean, making these books was like incredible. I mean, we took nothing and made something, yes. right? And, and the thing that I sort of always like about creative pursuits and book publishing in particular is that you're kind of, not the creator yourself or like I cannot write the book but I can make it happen yeah and I can help it come into the world yes. and that's always something I'd be proud of to help people tell their story is like an incredible gift yeah 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 that's beautiful and I think like I know I'm interviewing you but my answer to that to how well I remember Kobe was just like how he meant something different to each of his fans like oh, yeah for me, my people ask me all the time, like with my affinity publicly for him, like, what's your favorite moment? And I'll say that people ex expect like last game, 81 points, like any of the championships. Right. But I'm like, nah, in a game in March in his last season against San Antonio at home at Staples, he falls, he dives for a loose ball, dislocates his finger, goes to the sideline to Gary, Gary Vitti. <laughs> his first names are big on this podcast. <laughs> Tells Gary Vitti, who was retiring that year with him, pop this shit stuff back in, that I'm going back in the game, and he hits his next shot. Like, we, like we, were, we had 16 wins up at that point. That game meant nothing. Yeah. He's, he still had to put on a show three games later, and, or sorry, probably like 15 games later for 60 points. Yeah. But he was playing with this little kid. Like, that's my favorite moment, because, like, that just means – he, one of the things he always said was how you do small things is how you do all things. Yeah. So in a season that meant nothing, like we're not making the playoffs, we ain't doing stuff. Still, Mamba mentality, pop this finger back in, I'm hitting this next shot, we're going to win the game. Like, right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite on, like, basketball Kobe Bryant moment? No. <laughs> no, because I wasn't really a fan. I mean, that's, which I think was part of the reason why it kind of worked. Um, you know, and even some of that, 
um, fan appreciation of him, mm -hmm. I really saw much more of mm -hmm. one at events and then after he died where there was so much, yeah. there was such an incredible outpouring that you, you knew how much he meant to people, but it was amazing yeah. to see how much he meant to people. Yeah. And especially in a, in a, the version of him that I didn't know, right? Right. Yeah. Um, the the pre-2017 him. Yeah. Um, and a version that like he jokes about it all the time or before he passed as well, like how like when uh, Natalia and Gianna would be like, oh, you can actually play basketball. Cause like when they, they didn't remember any of that stuff when they were super yeah. young, like, when they were winning championships in Orlando, Indiana and all that stuff. Like, he was just this old guy putting up a lot of shots. Right? I mean, yeah, there was. I have, <laughs> they can, so yeah, he. We don't. They, they don't remember the old Kobe Bryant until uh, that last game against Utah. He, he, he was just old Kobe Bryant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's just the. Um, he, he right. He's just the person that you know who happens to be, in, you know, one of the top three best basketball players in the world. Yes. Yeah. Top top three, and he's not two or three. <laughs> but that's a debate. I'm gonna. We talked about a lot of the the Instagram warriors, keyboard warriors as well. That's a debate. I'm gonna leave to them. Oh Kobe yeah, will be they will debate it forever. Yeah, I like. I, I find no merit in it. What's done is done, <laughs> and we got a championship to win tomorrow. Um, where can where can we find you? Like, what would you like? Or let's let's phrase this better. Where firstly, where do we find you? outside of this space and secondly is there anything you'd like to tell the audience that hasn't been covered yet today uh well you can find me i um as you know i'm pretty active on instagram um and i you know it's public and you can definitely follow me and i'll have all of the news about grandy there um and it's just my first and last name elena morrow um i'm also on twitter but much less um interesting i think and certainly to myself i'm much less interesting um and then yeah i don't think so i mean we have the new book coming in december i think that's sort of the biggest if you want to go go get that book epica river of sands is can we it's wonderful it or not? Hmm? Can, can the audience pre-order it right now I absolutely you can pre-order it right now you can get it any place you buy books which you i have to say we, we can, can uh, we can discuss it afterwards as well but if you like if you want to sauce like the, the kids say sauce throw in like, yeah. a, like a discount code for viewers who watch this at the all, all the way up until the end, which might not be no one because this is like an hour and a half. <laughs> who watches hour and a half interviews anymore? But if you want to throw in a discount code for anyone who's watched, like by all means, and we'll, find it. We'll see what yeah. can we get. <laughs> see what we can get. Yeah. Cool. All well, right. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, this was truly, truly an honor and a privilege to represent the community of Kobe Bryant fans to speak with someone who has worked directly with. Our hero, our mentor, and for me, um, my, my father figure. So, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm just happy to be here. It's a great to talk. Amazing. Hey, everybody. Thank you for watching. We're happy to announce that we are offering 20% off of our convenient liquid nutrition. Go to our website, www.purposesmoothieco.com. All of the blend at home smoothies and the frozen soup. Enter the promo code WEGOTUS, W-E-G-O-T-U-S, and that's going to give you 20% off. That promo code is valid until October 20th. So hit us up. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out.